Well, welcome everybody to the Santa Barbara County and UC A&R Zoom meeting to discuss invasive shot hole bores. While we want this to be an informal and interactive meeting, we ask that everybody remains on mute unless you're presenting or participating in a discussion. Also, if you have questions, please put those in the chat during the presentations and we'll either answer those at that time or at the conclusion of that particular presentation. I'm Randall Oliver. I'm the statewide communications coordinator for invasive shot hole bores. And my responsibility today is just to facilitate the meeting, which will include several presentations, questions and answers and discussion. First up is going to be Dr. Beatrice Novoa Berman. She's the urban forestry advisor with UC Cooperative Extension in Los Angeles and Orange Counties. And she is going to talk about the history and biology of the beetles, the impacts and current infestations on a, on a broader scale, as well as management and techniques to stop the spread of the disease uh, and beetle. Then we have Hannah Vasilis. She's the statewide survey and trapping coordinator for invasive shot hole bores, UC statewide integrated pest management. And Hannah is going to talk about dispersal of the past, specifically in the Central Coast and Santa Barbara County. And then we will talk about programs and activities specific to Santa Barbara County. And that will be Stephanie Stark, Deputy Agricultural Commissioner with the County of Santa Barbara. So we can have questions and answers in between or e even during those presentations. We also have representatives from Ventura and San Luis Obispo County uh, Ag Commissioner's offices, Karen Lorson with San Luis Obispo County and John Bell. And both of them are deputy ag commissioners uh, with their counties, John's in Ventura. And then following those, we'll make it uh, wide open for discussion and uh, questions and answers. And with that, I think I will turn this over uh, to Dr. Nobu Berman. Thank you so much, Randall. And thank you. there is a lot of interest in learning the impact and management um, in how it to prevent the spread of it. So we're going to be covering this um, just uh, to give you some background. I've been working on invasive shadow borders for the last four years, doing research, doing management here in Orange County and also extended to LA County in somewhat uh, statewide. What I'm going to present here is some basic information about invasive shareholders, so some sort of way of laying the ground so we're all on the same page on the basic knowledge. And then the, after me, Hannah will be giving more specific information about distribution in Santa Barbara and surrounding counties, and then Stephanie is going to talk about those particular problems. So this is a more general idea of um, what this pest is about and what should we expect. All right, let's, let's get started. So the first question is, well, who are these invasive shahol borders? And most of you have heard of them, but just to give you the main idea. So we're talking about four different species of beetles. They uh, come from Southeast Asia, and they're teeny tiny. They're roughly the size of a sesame seed. Here in this picture on the right, you can see a female, which is the sesame seed size, and the males who actually are flightless and a lot smaller. They don't disperse, and um, they're kind of half the size. So they're teeny tiny. Uh, they're like look like fruit flies in a way. So. It's something that doesn't caught people's attention as for like, oh, I see a lot of these beetles. Plus they spend most of their lives inside the tree anyways. Um, these four species of beetles, they cannot be distin distinguished um, morphologically. So even for entomologists who are trained and look at them under a microscope is very hard to virtually impossible to distinguish them. So the only way to distinguish them is through DNA analysis. Um, but that's not too bad for us because in a way they all do the same kind of damage and the management is this, the management approaches are the same. So 
for us just to know that we're working with invasive shaho borers is in, enough. The two species on top, the Polyphagus shaho borer and the Kurosio shaho borer, are the ones that are present in California. But these beetles are all over the world. They're native to Southeast Asia, but as you can see, all these pink dots is showing where the beetles are present and where we know they're present right now. And they're invasive in other parts of the US, like in Florida and Hawaii, and they're in Central America, in South, uh, South Africa, uh, even the new location that we just learned about is um, in Australia. So there's many places who are dealing with this little bugs. So the one and one of the things that distinguish this pest from other pests is that we're talking about an insect disease complex. So both of the beetles that are in here in California have a very close relationship with a fungal disease. Um, the fungus that cause the disease is of the genus Fusarium. They also have um, close relationships with other fungi from other genuses, uh, but the one that ends up causing a disease in the tree and causes tree decline and eventually tree death is uh, mostly the Fusarium. And it's the disease is called Fusarium dieback. So that's another way that we can distinguish between the two species is by distinguishing the two uh, fungal um, associate, the two fungus fungi associated with each of the species. So the Kurosho is associated with one species and the Polyphagus is associated with a different fungal species, but both have the same effect overall on the trees, which is, as you can see in this picture, uh, it starts creating dieback and if the infestation is strong enough, um, tree death. So about how um, the life cycle of the beetle works, we'll start here to down to the left with a mated female that's dispersing and is carrying the fungal spores with her. Um, she finds a suitable host and then she starts digging tunnels into the trunk. Uh, in Within these tunnels, the beetles will start growing the fungus then laying the eggs and start growing the next generation. The larvae will actually feed exclusively on the fungus. So the beetles need the fungus to survive and grow. Um, then once the larvae just uh, develops into adults, the siblings, the males and female siblings will mate with each other within the galleries. And then we'll have again a female dispersing that's already mated and ready to start a new colony. Males usually, males cannot disperse and they stay inside their natal galleries and eventually die there. And the way the disease works here is a, a, a cut of a branch where we can see the arrow is showing the entrance of the gallery. And this is the beetle gallery um, inside this branch. And all this area that has this coloration is the area that is colonized by the Fusarium fungus. And what happens is that as a response, the tree starts clogging the vessels, just trying to keep the fungus compartmentalized in one location. And that once we have enough hits, enough um, attacks by the beetle, the tree starts clogging too many vessels and starts creating this dieback in the tree. Sometimes it's in a branch, like in this case, sometimes when the, the attacks go all around the trunk, the dieback starts from the top down. And these beetles have, uh, are not very picky. They have six, there are 65 species of reproductive hosts in California. And by that, we mean 65 species of plants that can support the beetle reproduction and the, and the fungal growth. The beetles will also attack uh, on another uh, 130, so uh, other species, but usually in that case, they're not reproductive hosts. So the beetles try to attack those other species, but they're not successful. 
But um, anyway, 65 species can actually uh, host the beetles and make more beetles, basically. Um, of those 65 species, the list that I'm showing you here is the shorter list of very susceptible hosts. And um, by that, we mean the ones where we've seen that the beetles can cause the tree death um, directly. In other hosts, the death of the tree can be a result of maybe the original decline and then another, maybe another disease can uh, get that tree, like a fungal disease can get that tree that's already pretty weak. So as you can see, within this speech, this short list, we have a lot of California natives. So our willows, the cottonwoods, some of the oaks, uh, the valley oak and the English oak in particular are uh, more susceptible. And then our, the sycamores and London plains are also very susceptible. And one species that I want to make a specific emphasis is the box elder. And the box elder is, as we know, at least here in California, is the species that is the most preferred and the most susceptible. So compared to all the other species, box elder gets attacked a lot more often. And also the decline is a lot faster. The beetles are very good at colonizing it. The tree's very bad at defending itself. So it will be one of the species where you really don't have much time from the moment of infestation until the tree really declines really fast. Uh, the other species, you might have more time to react before um, the tree gets a death sentence in a way. Um, but box elder is pretty fast, so you have to be very vigilant. And that's another thing that is important, especially for these counties that are more on the leading edge of the infestation, is that paying attention to the box elders that are not infested yet is a way to find when the infestation arrive to those new locations, right? Because we know that if the beetles are there and there's the box elder, they will find it. If you want to know the whole list, I encourage you to go to our website, uh, ishb.org, where uh, there's the whole list and we keep updating it as we find new hosts for this uh, pest. And the way we identify that the tree is infested with shahu border, the most important thing is this entry hole. So we usually don't see the beetles, but we see external signs and symptoms of infestation. So we see this entry hole in here that is perfectly round and is about the size of the tip of a medium ballpoint pen. And that's very important in every training that we do. We give people ballpoint pens. So you put it next to it and you can see if it's the right size. There's many other pests that make holes in the trees. And there's several beetles that make perfectly round holes in the trees. So it's always good to have some reference size to make sure that at least we are within the range of what we expect. Uh, and another thing that helps identify or make sure this is shahu border is if we shave the first layer of the bark. And that's especially good in the cases of trees with very rough barks where the entry hole is not so easily visible. We use a, a little chisel or a knife to shave the first layer of the bark. And we're exposing again the entry hole and surrounding the entry hole, we can see the tissue that has been affected by the fungus and that's why it's darker in coloration and then the live tissue surrounding it. So since the galleries or tunnels start very much perpendicular to the bark, so it goes right into it, when you shave the first layer, you'll still see that perfectly round hole that's the gallery going in. If you start seeing galleries that turn upwards or downward or like parallel to the bark, that's probably a different pest. And there's other things that can lead our attention to finding these infested trees, uh, like staining. They usually, um, the trees lose some water um, or sap um, out of the wound. So you will see some staining. Sometimes it gets darker staining associated with the holes. 
Uh, we can see frost that resembles very fine sawdust, especially in when the infestations are a little bit more advanced. Uh, some trees respond by gumming, um, and some other trees like avocados respond by making the sugary exudates that look like sugar volcanoes. So because there's so many different species of trees that get affected by this beetle, every tree will react differently. So we cannot find one sign fits them all. So we'll see that something's wrong with that tree. We just have to get close there and find that exit hole that has the right size. If we, there's no exit hole, we cannot attribute that to shah hole border. It will always be a hole. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of the kind of impact that this pest can have, um, this is what happened here in Orange County in Laguna Niguel Regional Park. This area was very heavily infested around 2016 and basically 90% of the sycamores in the park got very severely infested and had to be removed. And you can see what the coverage of trees looked before and after about 500 trees that were amplifier trees, which is what we call when the trees are severely infested um, after their removal. Um, we got a lot less tree coverage. And to show you another flashy example of what ha could happen in a natural environment, this is the Tijuana River Valley in San Diego County. And this is an infestation by Corocio Shaho border. And this is what it used to look in May of 2015. And after Kuroshi Shahobur attack all of those uh, willows. This is how it looked nine months later. The good news is that after a while, um, it started to somewhat re-sprout and, and recover. But in the meantime, we had a lot of coverage loss, and a lot of um, uh, loss of habitat for um, the fauna that lives there and also a lot more prone with invasive weeds like a rondo and um, castor bean that basically found the opportunity and start growing. Um, this is a case that is not the most common case like this very severe um, attacks but it could happen and it's just to give you an idea but you could still lose even if you don't lose like 90 percent of the canopy you could be losing maybe 50 percent of the canopy when we have like a very severe infestation all of a sudden. So better to try to prevent that as much as possible. This is very briefly the current layout of where the, these beetles are here in Southern California. So the red dots are showing where Polyphagus shahobor is and the blue dots show where Kurosio shahobor is. And this is only from samples where we were able to either collect a beetle in I did through DNA or collect a sample of the fungus and identify the fungus. So these are DNA uh, verified uh, observations. And basically we have polyphagus shahobor started, the infestation started in Los Angeles County. Um, the first site was in 2003, but it was thought to be a different species. Uh, the Tisha Hobor, which is on the same complex, but it doesn't have such a strong um, impact. And then by 2012, it was finally determined as a different species. And that's when we learned that polyphagus Shahobor was the thing and was the problem that we were having here. And by then, the infestation was widespread through the county and surrounding counties. Um, most likely these beetles arrived to this area through um, packaging materials and pallets uh, made of wood. So it's just the commerce and um, exchange between, you know, just, uh, just ship, shipping from one um, side of the world to the other. Um, so that's where polyphagus and slowly started just uh, spreading. 
And for Corrosio, we found it for the first time in San Diego County in 2014. And then later on, we started finding this little focuses in um, this one here in Santa Barbara of Corrosio Shaho border. And one of the things that this map is showing us is that for Corrosio, for example, we have infestation here, and then it sort of jumps over here without having much Corrosio in LA County, or even in Orange County, which is only have in Southern Orange County. And so how did this tiny beetle that is like the size of a sesame seed is a pretty lousy uh, flyer. It can, you know, imagine if you're so tiny, try to fly all the way from San Diego to Santa Barbara. And what we realize is that um, that this is this pest is hitchhiking in something else. And most probably, what what we found is the two bigger pathways for dispersion is green waste and firewood. So to give you an example of what happens with green waste, there's um, this is an example of trees that were severely infested, so they had to be removed, and they were chipped. Um, the chips were fairly big, and you can see in this picture on the right, in the chip, you can already see the gallery, like the piece, the sections of the gallery that were still in those chips and the discoloration caused by the fungus. Um, and those chips were then given to someone else to use as mulch. Uh, in this case, it was a strawberry farm. So we collected those chips and wear them in cages. And we found that at least one beetle per five gallon bucket of chips. Uh, so that means you have a bit about 40 beetles for every cubic yard of infested mulch. And if you know how much mulch you usually use in an area, that's that's quite a lot of beetles because because you need a lot of cubic yards of mulch uh, for for uh, taking care of big area. So just green waste is one po very possible way, one big pathway this beetle moves, uh, trimming in one area and then just taking those trimmings to some yards where they collect the green waste. That's another uh, other places where they become hotspots um, of infestations, just because it's collecting things that might be infested coming from different areas of the county. And the other one, of course, is firewood. Um, these beetles can survive in downwood for a long time, especially if they're logs. Um, so by moving firewood, and especially when these beetles attack oaks and other species that have wood that is good for, for as firewood, they um, very easily can be transported long distances by people that not necessarily did it on purpose. Um, they just see cheap firewood, or they just had to cut a, a tree and they take the wood to use in their cabins and they're just bringing the pests to another region. And this is not just for shahoe board, there's many tree pests that actually move in firewood. So a lot of our efforts on outreach is to make emphasis in not moving firewood. And we have a campaign called buy it where you burn it, meaning just don't bring firewood to your campground, don't bring firewood to your cabin, just buy it locally. So at least you're not bringing things from outside your um, area. Um, after this, I'm just going to dive into some of the best cultural practices that we can use to um, prevent the spread or manage this pest. So I'm going to talk about monitoring to find infestations early, about the removal of infested trees and infested branches, and how to correctly dispose infested material to make sure we're not dispersing this pest further. So I'm always gonna make emphasis in monitoring because finding the infestations early and taking action is one of the best ways to prevent it from becoming a big problem. Uh, for that, both visual assessments of the trees and uh, using traps to locate areas where the beetles might be 
present are both good weight. They they have pros and cons from one and the other, but uh, so visual inspections will be usually more localized so you can find where the trees are, but trapping is good because then you can set up traps and then wherever you have a trap with that's catching beetles, you can go and do visual inspections in the areas close to that. The traps, um, the most used ones kind of look like this. Is This is like a panel uh, with sticky goo on it. And what we, on a pole, this, the traps, we do not put them on the tree. We put them on a pole, so we don't want the beetles to be attracted to a tree. Um, and over here, this thing, this pouch here is the um, lure, which is for several. And we use the lure, it's something that attracts the beetles, but it's not a pheromone, it's not super, super attractive. And so it will only find beetles if the beetles are already in the area, but it would definitely not bring beetles from far away to that area because it's not such a strong attractant. So that is good in the sense that have, putting a trap is not going to bring beetles to that location. It will only show you if that location is infested or not. So we find we are monitoring and we're finding a tree that is heavily infested. So heavily or severe, severely infested, we're talking about a tree that has more than 150 active entry holes and already showing dieback. It could also be a branch that is infested. And in that case, we also will try to remove that branch and leave the, the rest of the tree. So by removing that branch, we're removing like the highest percentage of beetles in that location. Um, what happens when a tree gets severely infested and is already showing this level of dieback like I'm showing you here is that their vascular system is already too compromised and this tree it might stay like that for a while but it, it will most likely not make it so while that tree that will probably die is sitting in there it keeps being a big source of beetles because the beetles keep reproducing in that tree in creating more beetles. And so it's in having more beetles to start attacking all the surrounding trees. Um, and the other problem with this kind of trees is that they might become hazards. If you can see here on the right is a branch that was severely infested with shaho borders. All of these um, lines in here, those are the tunnels or galleries from the beetles. And as you can see, it's riddled with galleries. So if you combine the physical damage that the beetles do, plus the structural damage that the fungal infection does, those branches are very uh, brittle and very easily can break, especially because the beetles really like to attack the color of the branch, so the branch can fail and fall. So that becomes a big hazard, uh, especially if we have trees next to houses or in parks where people might be um, going around. So you really have to take care of those infested trees early. If you find them early enough, you might have to just remove a branch. And if it's later on, you might have to remove the whole tree. But when that happens, uh, following the tree removal with removing the stumping and or grinding the stump is really, really important because the beetles can still remain in the stump for a long, long time. So we want to get rid of all of it or at least cutting flush to the level of the ground. In my experience with what we've been managing here in, with Orange County Parks, uh, timely removal of amplifier branches or amplifier trees, so those trees that have big populations of beetles, or those branches that have big populations of beetles, makes a huge difference. Because when you do that, you sort of lower the beetle pressure and those trees that have low levels of infestation, sometimes they just can, you give them an opportunity to respond by themselves. But if you leave those sources of beetles around, those other trees keep getting attacked and attacked and, and they will eventually also become heavily infested. So it really makes a big difference to do this in a timely manner. And once we have this um, downward, uh, remember, as I said, beetles can survive downward for 
even months. And so there's steps to do a correct dispose of infested material to make sure we're not moving beetles. So chipping the wood is already very effective. So if we manage to chip to, in, to chips that are less than one inch, you kill 99.9% .9 of the beetles. It's actually more like the shaking uh, than the actually chipping that, so not, it's, it's like the smaller the size are more violent shaking and that's what kills the beetles inside. But even if that's not possible, because we know that the equipment has to be very sharp and new and maintained very well to achieve this, even if the chip, um, the chips are three inches and smaller, that already kills 98% of the beetles. So it's always a good thing to do to chip the material because you're already lowering the amount of beetles that you might potentially have in that um, downward or in infested material. Now, if you want to get rid of everything, once you have, if you solarize or compost those chips in a correct manner, you will get rid of 100% of the beetles. So that will be the most recommended practice. If you can do solarizing or composting to those chips. And then after that, those chips can be used as mulch in a safely manner. If you're working with logs, you can also solarize uh, logs or kiln dry logs um, to get rid of the beetles. And that's been used sometimes to use reclaimed wood for making different kinds of wood projects. Um, but that's not be all very often an option, but for homeowners that have a branch maybe that they remove, they can solarize it at home if that's an option. And um, if we think about what can we tell the residents, what can they do regarding this pest? The best thing to do, and this is for residents, homeowners, and even land managers, the first thing is to keep trees healthy, a healthy, well-irrigated, well-maintained tree will be more likely to be able to respond and defend themselves from an attack of these beetles and any other disease. Um, we recommend monitoring the trees, finding infestations early. You might be able to just trim a branch and basically get rid of most of the problem before it becomes a big infestation in the area. Um, there's tools that we have to confirm suspected infestation, especially for homeowners or people that are not uh, super trained that we have some tools that will help you get through all the steps to make sure you correctly identify invasive shadow borders that is on our website ishb.org and then for residents they can consider different management options depending on what the situation is so as I said pruning infested branches is always a good option for low and moderately infested trees uh, there's options to be uh, treated you always need a licensed professional to do that. Um, and for severely infested trees, many times the, the option is just removal. Um, there are options to try to save that tree that are very expensive, but you know sometimes if the tree is very important uh, culturally, um, it, it might be worth it to, to go through that travel. Um, but a lot of the times they, the tree is in such a bad shape that they just won't survive it anyways. Um, now, very important to dispose of green waste properly for everyone. So as we know, we don't want to move this pest from one place to another, especially be careful with free mulch being offered uh, where you don't know where it comes from and you don't know what the source of that wood is. And of course, don't move firewood. Uh, also to prevent this pathway of movement of the pest. Um, other outreach resources that we can offer both um, you guys and the general public is, as I keep repeating our website, ishb.org, in there you can find an online training that is free, uh, shows you um, how to ID it and some management options. There's also the detection man and management assessment tool. And that's not the one that I, I was telling you, you can go there and it will prompt you through different steps to make sure it's shadow board and gives you some advice on what things you can do to manage it, depending on your situation. 
And then um, other outreach resources, we have a Facebook web page with updates, uh, our Twitter and YouTube um, accounts where you find more, more information. And all this is also the links to this, you can also find them in our website. And with that, uh, this is my contact information if anybody has any other questions and they think later. And if you have any questions and you wanna bring them up now, I'm all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Clark de Blasio. I'm community education specialist with uh, UC Cooperative Extension and Ventura. Bea, we don't have any questions in the chat um, yet. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I encourage any of you um, now to um, enter your questions in the chat so Bea can answer them. And while we're here, um, if we wait for if people have any questions, there's also for those of you who might be interested in more in depth um, workshop about how to manage and how to use integrated pest management to manage this pest. I'll be giving a workshop next week in the Landscape Expo in Long Beach, where we have an hour and a half to go in depth and look at different scenarios on different options for um, depending on the tree state and where the tree is and how the level of infestation is, is showing. So um, that's an option for that. And stay tuned because we'll always do trainings more targeted toward practitioner, practitioners and green industry professionals that might want to know exactly more techniques on how to manage this pest. Yeah, we have several questions that have come in while you were speaking just now. Um, Diego Cordero asks, how mature are the trees being attacked usually? That's a great question. We tend to see them more often in uh, bigger trees, like trees between, I'll say, 15 and 25 inches in dBH. Uh, but so in general, small, smaller trees don't get that attacked, but we do see it in, in smaller trees. Um, it's not like they don't get attacked at all. It's just, they usually like better established trees, but the other ones are not free of uh, risk in a way. The younger the tree, uh, it might have, if it doesn't get attacked a lot, it might have a better chance of compartmentalizing and growing and getting rid of it. Ken Knight asks, is there a treatment to kill the beetles? There's treatments. Uh, there usually the treatments are a combination of insecticides and uh, fungicides because you want to target both the fungus and the beetle. Um, there's several options uh, for using systemics or trunk sprays. Um, they've been uh, tested and proved that they are effective. So there, there are different options for, for that, yes. Okay. Uh, it usually works better in trees that are, have lower levels of infestation. Once the infestation is too widespread and too severe, sometimes it doesn't, uh, it's not enough, you know. George Thompson would like to know if there's any evidence that ISHB affects eucalyptus. Not really. There's uh, one species that um, I think is glo uh, globulus that gets uh, attacked sometimes, but it's not, it's not, it's just only if the tree had a canker and it has already an area that is very um, weakened and the beetles like to go in the margins of that canker. Uh, but it's, for the most part, eucalyptus are not affected. Neither are pines or pepper trees. Um, that's like when you go do your surveys, um, usually don't waste your time on eucalyptus because you won't find them unless it's like a very severely infested area then the beetles get very adventurous in 
trying to find your host when the area is very heavily infested. If not, if they just tend to stay on their preferred host, which are mostly that small list that I show you um, in some, like they will try some others of the reproductive hosts, but mostly they stay on the sycamores, the willows, and the valios and such. Christopher Berry would like to know how long chips or logs should be solarized. That's a great question. So for the solarization, you want the material under the tarp to reach um, certain temperature for a certain like for a certain period of time. So it really depends on the season. Uh, for the summer um, times, it's usually like with two months or so, you you're fine. But if you are doing the solarization in the fall or the winter, you might want to leave them down there for about six months to ensure that at some point the temperature within that load reaches the point where it will kill the beetles. Um, if you go into our website, there's uh, uh, it explains different tips on how to actually do the solarization correctly. But one of the most important things is that you need to tarp the materials from underneath and on the top. It doesn't work if you just throw a tarp on it and, and put some logs to keep it down. You really need to enclose that material very good because you just, what you want is to trap all the beetles underneath and not let them escape while they sort of cook down there. Um, so very, very important to have all, all the ends very tucked under and, and nothing so the beetles cannot escape. Uh, check on our website, there's uh, more tips about that. Um, and this is a message for me to Cameron Benson. Um, you had a question about the process to solarize. Um, please, if you if your question isn't um, adequately answered by Bea, please put another question in the in the chat and also check the website. Um, Kim not. Ken Knight asks if trees with less than 150 hits can survive. Yes. Um, the, so the 150 hits, of course, it's um, we had to put a cut somewhere, right? It's not like, oh, the tree has 141, it's doomed. And everything is situation specific. So Keep that in mind. So more than 150 is sort of what you're looking for. So if it has more than 150 and has dieback, it is a candidate for removal. Um, but you might have a if it's a small like a small tree that has 100 hit, like I don't know a tree with like a five dbh that has 100 hits that might be super compromised. It's a, the vascular system might be super compromised. So it's always a case by case. But in general, yeah, trees with less hits are more likely to survive. Um, if the trees get treated, they have better chances. Um, in some cases, if the trees are not treated, but you manage to, uh, you, you get to manage the sources of beetles, the trees can respond on their own and actually overcome the infestation. A lot of this is very species dependent and location dependent. So I did see a lot of sycamores being able to recover. In, in some cases, even trees with more than 150 hits are able to recover as long as the infestation sources that those amplifier trees and amplifier branches get just moved out of the way and the tree can actually respond on its own. Okay, thank you. Another, another second question from Ken is, if no galleries are present, is stump grinding necessary if the trees are removed at ground level? You remove them at ground level? <clears throat> Sorry, at ground level? Um, that, that's, a, that's a good option, especially if you want the trees to re-sprout. So you don't need to grind it. Just keep in mind, um, if you see one of the, the heavily infested trees in sycamores, I've seen the beetles go into the root flare. 
like even if there's roots that go out of the out of the ground somewhere like the big roots they'll just hit there as well so these beetles are kind of vicious when they find a tree that they really really like and one of the things that we found with the stumps is that sometimes even in stumps we found a case of a stump that was it was, had no green like no resprout nothing it was just a dead stump but it seems like it had been grafted underneath two other trees and in what happened in that location is that we kept finding more infested trees and like like beetles in the traps and we couldn't figure out where the source of beetles was and eventually we, we looked at that stump that we were overlooking because it was like a totally dead stump and we found that the beetles were coming from there so stumps can be deceiving in that sense and that's why we as a rule of thumb tend to recommend to remove them but if you cut them to the like, ground level that's a really good way especially if you want to let it resprout if you are talking about a natural area that 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 would be actually the best like if you're working with willows uh just cutting them to the ground level and let them resprout is is a good it's a good way in my opinion to manage that John Bell asks, how long after a tree branch is chopped down, will or can ISHB stay in the branch or log? We know they can stay for months. We don't have the exact data. We haven't done any research on keeping the logs, uh, you know, and timing them and checking. But we, we know from our experience that even usually is weeks and but sometimes even months after it's been cut there's still live beetles inside especially if the trunk is kind of big and still contains their moisture there's larvae that can still develop in there okay stephanie stark asks are there any differences in the movement damage control between pshb and kshb well the answer will be there might, but they don't seem to be significant. Um, the, we, what we found is that in general, the way you approach one or the other is basically the same. Um, our experience in the management in San Diego where they're dealing with Corocio and the management in LA and Orange County where we're dealing mostly with polyphagus is the same. Um, in, in the kind of uh, impact that they can have is the same uh, for both of them. So that, and that's why we ended up starting to talk about invasive shuffle borders to lump them both because we cannot distinguish them um, and, and we, uh, the approach to management is the same. We have no more questions, but I'd like to thank George Thompson for researching and sharing the link to the um, shot hole borer website page that discusses how to handle infested material. So that's if you check the chat, that link is in there if you'd like to, um, to read about it. Thank you, Bea. Thank you all. And if you have any more questions, I know some people had questions about uh, treatments or managements. Um, you can always uh, send me an email and I can provide more information regarding that, um, those other options that are like more in specific for each tree. Um, so and for any of you or any other questions or anything that I, you missed a link or whatever, you just feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, I, I thank you for those comments. And our next presenter will be Hannah Vasilis. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to chime in about the eucalyptus question. There is, I mean, it's uh, been reclassified as Carimbia, but it's Carimbia fissifolia, red flowering gum, which is on the reproductive host list, but it's also not a very preferred host. So um, maybe if you're in an area with high beetle pressure, it would be worth checking those out, but 
sometimes they don't get hit as hard as a more preferred host. All right, um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, this is the same map that Aya showed, but I, what I'm here to talk about is just the distribution in generally in California, and then more specifically within this region of Santa Barbara County. My priorities as a statewide survey and trapping coordinator is to manage a lot of data that is coming in from each county doing their trapping and doing visual assessments of trees in their areas, um, mostly focusing on the reproductive hosts that are the most susceptible. So far, um, I can report that no beetles have been positively identified outside of this leading edge, this host range. And um, what I mean by the leading edge and the host range is, um, for example, uh, every county that has had either polyphagus or corrosio shot hole borer detected in it is colored in this map. The light blue is Crucio, red is polyphagus, and then the purple is where both species have been found. So, so far, some of the newer expansions or detections that we've had are in the San Bernardino County. We're fighting more um, within the um, Inland Empire. And then um, you know, Ventura County has seen some spread as well. And then here, or for most of you in Santa Barbara County, there was a new detection in 2020, I want to say, in the San Ynez region. And the, the point of this statewide trapping program is to do presence absence detection in each county and at least try to be able to say, you know what, we trapped here and we couldn't find it, or we trapped here and we did find it, and then we would be able to put more resources into um, delimiting the pest in that specific county. So far, I don't think San Luis Obispo within this trapping program has not found any more positive identifications of ISHB. Um, and it just seems to be the, the one and I'll let um, San Luis Obispo County speak on their findings a little bit more in case they have any updates. And with that, um, I'm switching over from the red and blue dots to just red dots because this includes specimens that were um, genus level identifications. So as Bea was mentioning earlier, you cannot tell the difference between uh, PSHB and KSHB with the eye alone. So sometimes you'll find it in a tree. It's very obviously the invasive shot hole borers, but um, you don't necessarily need to get it species, um, you know, species level identification. And then this is Santa Barbara region, a little bit more close up. Um, in Santa Ynez, well, let me start from the beginning. Um, the first detections were in 2016 and 2017 in the Montecito region of Santa Barbara County. So that's the South County. And those findings were all Hiroshio shot hole borer. And um, some of these specimens, the trees here were actually taken out in the mudslide that had happened. Uh, but since then, we have found um, more KSHB in um, Manning Park. Is that correct, Stephanie? That's Manning Park. And then the, there's a YMCA correct. over here in um, in um, Montecito. Yeah, and Manning Park's have, in Montecito. So those have since been um, identified as the Corocio shot hole borer. And um, there are severely infested trees here, um, definitely with with dieback and a substantial amount of damage. Um, up here, we have a positive trap find. And then more recently, um, in August of this year, 
in the Hidden Valley, kind of by Ellings Park area, there are some sycamores that were identified to have invasive shot hole borer. And I'm not sure if these have been determined to species level. So then we go up to the you know, more central region of the county, and there is Santa Ynez Park and Santa Ynez, and they have found many Acer Nagundo. And this is what Bay was talking about. The box elder are just very, very preferred host. So this was a, about in, um, I wanna say March of this year, right? Stephanie, when you first started to get trap detections in this park? Yeah, once this trees, we were finding it in the traps is what we were finding, but we were not sure where the trees were that were the source amplifier trees. So not until uh, trees started leafing out, did we realize, oh, we have some box elders here. So once we went out with you, well, I guess that was around May-ish is when uh, we started to see, um, get uh, start taking wood samples. Yeah, so this, mm -hmm. this is a really good example of how, you know, trapping helped with this detection um, because the trap finds were substantial for the region. And like Stephanie said, they were trying to find where the amplifier trees were and eventually we did track them down to be box elder. And um, this is just a good learning experience for all of us in knowing that box elder are just very attractive to the pest. So if you know where your box elder are, if you have a tree inventory, um, even if you're outside of where ISHP has been detected with box elder, you will, you know, should put up traps around that area, even if you haven't found the beetle yet. Um, and this is just some more detail of that. There's this riparian corridor here with a bunch of Acer Nagundo and there's some California sycamore also. And then this is the um, same view that I showed you earlier. And um, with that, um, I wanna say the, the earliest traps in the region are from um, UCSB, uh, the River Lab. I think Shelly Bennett had put out a bunch of traps and so she had documented a lot of KSHB around 2016 and 2017. And, since then, the County Ag Commission's office has been setting up traps and doing a lot of surveys to try to find where this beetle is in the county. Um, so that's, that's basically it with the overview of the distribution in the county. Um, if you have any questions for me, and another thing is that I do compile data from any natural resource agency. So if you do have your own trapping data or um, visual survey data, um, please get in contact with me. Um, I don't put my contact information out there, but um, I'll give it to you if you want it. And then I will pass it along to Stephanie, who's going to talk more about the specifics of the different programs that the county is involved in. Hey, before we move to Stephanie, and thank you, Hannah. Um, um, does anyone have any questions for Hannah? Anna, can you put your um, email address in the in the chat, please? Of course, I will do that right now. It doesn't look like we have any questions, so let's go ahead and uh, move on to Stephanie. Okay, thank you, um, Randall. I'm going to share my screen now. It says host disabled. Could you give me rights? Oh, 
Okay. I think. You see anything yet? Yep. Okay. Do you see the the two screens or do you see just the one? We see the one that said we questions. <laughs> okay. So I'm trying to figure out if you have the right screen. Um, okay. ISHB grant program. Great. It's just the one picture? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Good morning, everybody, to the ISHB. This is so exciting to see everybody here. It's um, been a long time coming, and um, me and all of our partners have been working together to get this um, important information to you. So I really appreciate you coming this morning. It means so much. And this pest is uh, spreading and we want to uh, find ways to share information and ensure that we can do what we can to prevent it from spreading further. So thank you very much for coming. So I'm going to cover um, about our grant program, which is with Cal Fire. And with that, I'll talk a little bit about our um, provide an overview of the grant itself. And with that, I'll discuss the tools that we're using to detect invasive shot hole borer in our county, including the trapping, the visual surveys, and the tracking of invasive shot hole borer, the mapping that we do, kind of tie that together, and then the wood sampling that we conduct. And at the end, I'll talk about our tree removals so far. And as Ryan uh, Casey mentioned earlier, we are actually currently re removing trees today at this very moment. It, um, uh, Manny Park in Montecito. And then I'll cover next steps, which I think is really important so we can um, continue the conversation about how we can control this pest in our county. So there are many partners involved and um, many of you came today and I, I appreciate that. And if they, people weren't able to come, we'll have more of these in the future. But our partners um, have been with County Parks and uh, Public Works planning development and uh, parks. Also with Ken Knight, he provided us with a tree inventory that's been a very critical tool in helping us find where are those sycamore trees and the box elders that are important hosts. So I wanted to mention that for San Luis and Ventura counties, if you haven't already gotten your um, tree inventories, that's a nice tool to have. Also, like I mentioned, our LA Ventura and San Luis Obispo, Orange County, San Bernardino, we've had task force meetings on and off to uh, discuss this pest and this grant because a lot of us have this um, same grant with Cal Fire who's been generous in providing all those resources for us. And all of our cities, uh, many of you I've spoken to directly and uh, a lot of the UC uh, branches with um, IPM, um, as well as UCSB. We've been out to do visual surveys there and our arborists and the certified green waste facility that we've been working with in Santa Paula to help us with disposal of the, uh, the chips. And not, last but not least, the San Inez Band of Shumash. I'm so glad that we were able to have you come today. So with the um, CAL FIRE block grant, the objective is really to prevent the spread of invasive shot hole borer. And the scope of work includes, you know, trapping, the visual surveys, the mapping. We always share our data with um, Hannah Vesalis and all of our other partners, as well as our, um, um, our other departments to share where we are finding this pest. And I'll talk about the tools that we have to do that. And we are con using uh, or conducting a lot of education and outreach. I mean, that's why a lot of you are here today, so that we were um, getting you on board with what we can do to assist with detection of the pest. The grant itself, because we are a leading edge county, we take that very seriously um, because we want to do what we can to prevent the spread both within our borders as well as north into San Luis Obispo County. So. Our focus has been a lot on public lands because like Bea had mentioned with um, these dead and dying trees, they really do pre present a problem for public safety at these public parks and public spaces, um, both from just dropping limbs and fire potential. And also it does spread the beetles. So our focus has really been on um, public land. So that's why a lot of you here today from agencies are with um, public um, 
Hold on a second. Sorry, I got a call. Um, so yeah, the focus has been on public lands and um, we also have been focusing on removal of the amplifier tree. So I won't go into what the amplifier tree is. It, it um, has been something that uh, we've been focused on is just those removal of the whole trees, not portions of trees or any treatments or things like that. No chemical treatments, but it has been just um, limbs and things, or sorry, whole trees. So the grant does end March in 2024, and uh, the amount is about almost $600,000 for the grant. So um, we are um, about halfway through that so far. So trapping, we started kind of late in 2021, and that's because we had trouble securing grants from this or from the traps from the state, but we have them. They're the sticky traps. They're very general tools. So as Bea was saying, they don't go on the tree themselves. They go on a post and we have a lure to um, attract the beetle, the um, cursiviral lure. And we are keeping the traps up all year. So we're not just keeping them up for the flight season. We made a decision because we did get them up so late. We are going to have them up all year. And they are on a two weeks uh, trap cycle. So we check them every couple of weeks. The, when we do get a positive beetle, and you can see how small they are on the trap with the little blue circles, we send them up to um, Dr. Stouthammer's lab at UC Riverside because he can tell us the difference. We have to go through a series of steps to remove the sticky material off the beetles, which is quite time consuming, but we do want that data to know what are we seeing? Is this Carichio or polyphagus? Um, we believe that that is a good way to proceed with the trapping. So um, we do send those off to a separate lab, not the state labs. So that does take additional time. Um, and we always follow these up with visual surveys um, because just because we have a beetle on a trap, now we've got to go find the tree, right? So in this is slide covers where the trapping locations are. And you can see in, uh, we have, um, blue colors and red colors. So we have about 62 traps out right now in 32 locations. So, you know, roughly two traps um, per location. And mostly these are county parks, um, public parks, well, county, but also city uh, and also state parks. So all three of them. Uh, we have um, blue trap. Blue is just where the traps are located. Red are we've actually had finds, and you can see this is where the San Inez find is that um, Hannah talked about. We're finding more in the uh, city of Santa Barbara, and then also, of course, we talked about Montecito. And I'm, I just have it listed here on the slide where those positive finds have been Manning Park, Rocky Nook Park. Uh, Hidden Valley Park in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, we have um, suspects, uh, strong suspect. I just listed them here today, but we're waiting for analysis uh, for Oak Park and Stevens Park. And then also San Inez Park we talked about. So the visual surveys, um, this is when we go out and we take a look at the trees. This was a, a training we did with Hannah. You can see in the foreground and some of our inspectors. And we started doing those in November, 2020. Uh, we focus mostly on sycamores and box elder trees. Uh, like we talked about the box elder trees, we have a lot fewer of those in our county um, than we do the sycamore trees. The box elders, just like Bea had said, we see those, if they're affected, they get hit really hard. We see the staining um, very quickly. Um, they also have, sycamores also have smooth bark, so that can make it uh, easier to find the detections as well. Um, we look for those amplifier trees, the ones um, using the UC a &R guidance that um, were discussed before, the symptomatic trees, mostly on the trunks that we see first, more than the 150 attack holes, and then the crown dieback. So once it meets those criteria, um, then we start um, tracking them on our system and we map using uh, iNaturalist. Uh, one of our staff, Julia Kozowitz, um, had a great idea to have, create our own internal mapping system 
Um, we don't have a GIS system per se, but this was a nice convenient tool to trap for our department and we share it with our partners as well as um, with the UC so that um, Hannah has all the access to our data. So this shows uh, the red dots um, show where the um, uh, trees are that are positive for invasive shot hole borer and the green dots here, and this is in Manning Park. Lower Manning Park shows um, trees that are symptomatic, but maybe um, are not quite have met that amplifier threshold, but we're continuing to monitor them. So once they do meet that um, level or possibly close to that threshold of an amplifier tree, we map them in uh, iNaturalist. And we also tag the tree with a unique ID. We take a, a wood sample usually. We rarely see a beetle um, right on the trunk. So we end up taking the sample, um, a wood sample using those techniques that were discussed. And we send those off to our um, California Department of Food and Agriculture lab for uh, determination. And we do get back whether or not it is um, the fusarium related to the Crisio or the fusarium related to the polyphagus. So we that data does come back to us. It takes about a month. And again, we share our data with the our partners. This is just a photograph reminding you of that um, ballpoint pen, that size. It is almost exactly of the size of a ballpoint pen, the edge. So it does a little wiggle means we have found that that is too large. Um, too, can't get the pen in there, it's too small. It really is the size of a ballpoint pen. So we take a little bit of the bark off and uh, peel it back. And we have um, a sample here that we submit in a dry vial for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So this is a graphic representation um, to kind of unpack all this. So what happens with um, the visual survey? So either through an invasive shot hole bore sticky trap or a complaint from another jurisdiction. So we may get a call from a city or another county department saying, hey, I think we might have invasive shot hole bore. So we'll come out, um, we'll take a look at the tree, we'll do a survey, take a sample and um, follow up. And if the tree does meet um, that uh, amplifier tree criteria, we will um, um, let inform the jurisdiction. Um, if it, if it, excuse me, if it the tree symptoms meet the amplifier criteria, then we'll take a wood sample. But if it doesn't, um, we may still take a sample, but we'll still inform the jurisdiction and let them know either way. And we'll, we can always rate, put up a trap and monitor those, uh, those trees. So this is a slide showing our uh, tree removal information. Um, this is a um, sycamore tree that we removed, very large tree, specimen tree um, in a parking lot area, um, directly adjacent to Manning Park. And this tree took um, multiple days to remove um, and to chip and to grind the stump down. Um, they're using a bucket truck here to um, they start first start removing these um, smaller limbs and they use ropes to remove it and uh, just be extra safe. So you can imagine if this tree is heavily infested, what a hazard it can present to to the public. Um, and we are finding all of our trees pretty much seem to be in sensitive areas. Um, many of them are, meaning they're in creeks, um, maybe because they're getting water. Um, that's how they're getting their water, but they are in sensitive areas. So we are always um, uh, dealing with environmental constraints. So we work closely with uh, planning and development and um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, to work around bird nesting season and in creeks. And um, like I said, a lot of them that we're finding are the sycamores and box elders. The season um, for us is really short. Our tree removal season is really essentially September, early, early January. And uh, that's because of the bird nesting season. And also if um, there, there are also stream bed alteration agreement requirements and we don't wanna to have to get permits to remove those trees. So we're working closely with planning and fish and wildlife to ensure that we're not, um, uh, needing a permit because that will just add cost and the grant wouldn't cover it anyways. 
uh, it, it costs them maybe between two and six thousand dollars to remove per tree. Um, plus, you've got um, fees to haul the chip material, and we get it's roughly you know one tree a day, depending on the maturity of the tree. And as was mentioned, um, any um, the green waste should get chipped to a less than one inch diameter. So we have to perform that. This particular vendor has to double chip. So all the waste goes through one time and then it goes through again before it gets, the load is safeguarded and transported to a certified composting facility and a green waste disposal. So in December 21, 2021, that was our pilot project here where we removed uh, four sycamore trees in Manning Park. And um, now in October 2022, about um, you know 10 months later, we are removing this season 18 trees. And um, 13 of those are sycamore trees in Manning Park. And then the remaining balance of five trees is in San Inez. And we've just identified probably two additional amplifier trees in the last few days that will probably come down as well in um, Manning Park area. Um, so we're still waiting on sample results for those. So this is a, a slide again to kind of go over and review how we're sort of triaging these um, between the wood samples and the, the trapping and all that. So after we have a tree that's uh, determined to be an amplifier tree, uh, if it is um, uh, not an amplifier tree, we still inform the jurisdiction and we offer outreach and education. Um, so you have to remember we have traps out in many different parks, um, county parks, but also city parks, state parks. Um, and so that's how we handle those. So we continue to monitor those trees throughout the year, as I talked about with the traps. So if it is an amplifier tree, we go ahead and take a wood, wood sample. Uh, so if it is invasive shot hole borer and the samples come back, then, uh, and it is on county land, then we inform the county department. We work with planning development and um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and any other agencies, public works as well. Um, get the AOKs uh, to remove the tree safely and transport the green waste and uh, grind the stumps down. So if it is um, not invasive shot hole bore, again, we inform the jurisdiction or if it's not on county land. So um, that's how we triage those, um, that process we've developed over time. So next steps. Uh, through this process, we are continuing our tree removals um, as we move forward and we're continuing our visual surveys. We're gonna continue trapping. As I said, we're maintaining the traps through the winter time. Um, uh, just because we want to be on the safe side and we are on a leading edge of county and we are continuing to monitor those symptomatic trees that maybe didn't meet that threshold but uh, we're still want to make sure if that could always progress um, to an amplifier tree so we're always monitoring those and we're continuing to work with our partner agencies that we mentioned earlier. And we do that by um, responding to any reports of invasive shot hole borer. Um, we continue to take um, wood and beetle samples as needed. We provide the outreach education. And we also have traps out. I didn't list that, but we've got traps out at lots of different jurisdictions. So some new things we're looking at uh, following this meeting is to find new ways how we can support our partners. And um, we want to increase homeowner awareness and homeowner engagement. Um, our first step is to really reach out to the agencies and uh, have a kind of more of a community discussion about invasive shot hole bore and uh, moving forward to uh, really um, do more outreach to those homeowner areas because there are they do border private um, private homes and private property and also address the pathways that were mentioned earlier about um, green waste and firewood so with that if there's any questions um, happy to answer those Stephanie thank, thank you Thank you, Stephanie, for the presentation and and especially for initiating this very important meeting. I think it's it's really good to get all 
the different counties together. Um, we do have a couple of questions to start off with. Um, Ken, uh, Ken Knight asks if uh, any traps are have been set at Vandenberg Space Space Force Base. No, we have not set any traps at Vandenberg, but we can certainly do that. Okay. And and Randall Oliver asks if if the Cal Fire grant only removes trees on county lands, what should cities and other entities do? Well, the the vision is that we would be assisting the partners with all the other aspects of um, uh, trapping and um, the monitoring, the visual surveys, and other cities can um, certainly we can work together to um, discuss how cities themselves can uh, remove trees if and when they feel like it's appropriate. So we feel like, um, like for example, the city of Santa Barbara, we worked with them on a situation where they came to us and said, hey, we think we have invasive shot hole borer on this street tree. We went out, we took samples, uh, wood samples, submitted those, got them back, and the city of Santa Barbara decided to remove the tree. So that's really kind of um, how the two, our two jurisdictions, our two um, partners can work together. Would that also apply to the many uh, different jurisdictions of federal lands in the county? Absolutely, yes. And we've been reaching out to um, US Forest Service as well. Uh, we have a lot of connections through our, our weed management area, for example, and we've been reaching out to them um, as well as state, state parks. And I think there's somebody here today from state parks. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew Raff asks, uh, what about infested trees that are on private property? If the property owner is willing to have the tree removed, does the grant cover that? The grant does not cover that currently, um, the way the scope is written. Um, however, we can certainly, uh, as we move through this process and uh, discuss with our partners how we can best address some of those uh, private properties, especially the ones that are up against other jurisdictions, we can uh, look at amending the grant, but we would have to amend the grant to um, address removal on private properties. Because that, that's a whole different level of review and what we're learning in this process and we're the Ag Commissioner's Office, we're not typically removing trees as part of projects. So this has all been very new for us. Um, it's quite a bit of work to make sure you're getting through all those hoops and making sure that um, we try and remove the trees in blocks. And so we just wanna make sure that we are not on the hook for any um, potential issues that come up with a, you know, a private property. And um, it's a lot of work. Some counties do do that though. Thank you. We have no more questions. Oh, wait. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ken Knight asks, is treatment of trees a viable option to removal? For example, is there an estimate of costs, or specifically, is there an estimate of costs for treatment if that is desired for trees with less than amplifier status? And I would defer that question to our expert, um, Bea. Yeah, so the cost estimate will vary a lot depending on which treatment you decide to do. And which treatment you decide to do has a lot of other things to consider to make that decision based on where the tree is, if it's close to water or not because some of the treatments you cannot do them close to the water. So you're gonna to have to end up doing a trunk injection. And so it's hard for me to tell you exactly what the cost will be because it depends on the situation, how infested the tree is in which treatment or combination of treatments you decide to go with and which ones you can do because in some cases you're restricted to only a few options. Uh, so it is a viable option 
I cannot tell you how much it's going to cost because it's very dependent on each situation. And just want to say, since I have the mic for a second, um, because we were talking about corrosion and polyphagus, and we were saying, well, they're the same symptoms, you identify them the same way and you manage them the same way, but it was still sending samples and trying to figure out which one it is. You might wonder why. And the reason is because, especially in this area where it's the leading edge, we don't know which species is in there yet. It's just us, the scientists, we, you know, we like to bother people and we really want to know. Um, but it, knowing which species it is, it might give us some insight on if there is or not any difference in how these two species disperse. But also, for example, knowing that Kurosio was in San Diego and then the one that we found in Santa Barbara was Kurosio gave us more uh, support to the idea that green waste in firewood is what actually helps the dispersion. So it's not necessary to know that for the management, but especially in areas with new infestation, we push to know that because it gives us more information about how to tackle this problem. That's why. In case you were wondering, maybe not. <laughs> uh, this next question is for any of our presenters um, from Andrew Raff. Uh, he would like to know um, if there seems to be any correlation with creeks or other water features and uh, beetle infestations. I can answer that too if you want. Um, so there is. Um, there is the correlation of finding more infestations next to creeks or water features. We did not find any support, evidence to support that having a tree that is more irrigated will make it more susceptible to the beetles, though at the beginning we thought that was the case. Um, we, the main reason that this might have this correlation that we see might happen is because of the kind of species that the tree, the beetles attack. They're mostly riparian species. So you're, if the, the beetles attack willows, they like willows, you're gonna find willows in a riparian area. So that is why. So yes, riparian areas have more prevalence of those species that are more susceptible and more preferred by the beetles. So you will, have those areas as a more susceptible or an area that you might wanna keep an eye on. Thanks. And finally, John Bell asked for Bea, um, do, if you think that bark, box elders should have a lower threshold in terms of holes as far as management. Right, uh, maybe. Uh, we don't really have that, um, totally to the T, but um, it might. I have heard other researchers saying for box elders, the window between having a few holes and having a lot of them is very short. And so, you know, you, you might be, have less chances of, of rescuing that tree even if you're trying to treat it in the case of box elders, um, even with less amount of holes. It's just because the beetles are so good at reproducing in it. And the other thing that we notice in box elders compared to other species is that in the trunk, the beetles tend to, in, in most of the in other species, they, they dig the tunnels until they reach the cambium. And then they, they sort of, branch and, and go at the cambium level, they start going sort of parallel to the bark. So, so you have like a ring of galleries around the trunk when you cut it, right? In box elder, it seems like the wood is a lot softer and can support beetle even in the hardwood. So you'll see galleries going all the way through even in the bigger trunks. So it does seem like maybe structurally and also in the case of natural defenses, boxers are pretty bad at doing it, bad at compartmentalizing, bad at defending from shallow borders. So yeah, it does seem like 
having a, a, a box of the jazz attacked, it's, um, I would be very scared for that box alert in any level of infestation. You have to be very careful, act very quickly and uh, hope for the best. Thanks for that question, John. And uh, we are getting close to the end of our scheduled time, but um, we have uh, some time left. Uh, if uh, John or um, Karen um, want to talk about uh, their counties and the programs and, and how they're similar to what's taking place in Santa Barbara or, or what differences there might be. So uh, John, do you want to uh, comment on that? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, we and, and like I've been kind of uh, mentioning, we we have a lot of uh, a lot of our trees that we've removed are box elders, probably about probably about seventy percent. And we haven't we but we unlike um, over there, we we are doing private property, and it and as Stephanie said, it's very it's very um, say tedious but it's very a lot of little work to to get through with the the entities like the city of santa paula the city of ojai um and then we uh, uh, our other trees are in the county so they're there i think that we have a uh, a pathway for for removing them that's in some ways more set up with the county uh with the planning department but the cities there's often like little um there might be like the city of Ojai has a tree committee and then different permits and that are different from the city of Santa Paula. And, uh, and then the other thing is that, that each individual homeowner, you're dealing with a homeowner and we're taking them out of backyards and uh, front yards and they have their own unique uh, personalities, these homeowners that, um, that you have to deal with. And, um, and the other thing in our county, we're, we're trapping quite a bit and Lance and uh, Ruben, who are on the call here, are really doing a great job of putting out traps. And we put out, I think we, this year we put out about 500 and so far about 523 and uh, traps. And we're trying to go to places like, um, we are going to the Point Magoo uh, Naval Base. And also we've gone to the parks, which require, those are, Things that we require permits to get those traps up and a lot of interaction to get those in certain areas and uh but we're trying to again go to places that we haven't found it and we we found it in quite a few areas uh so our county is pretty quite you know uh infested and we're trying to go into areas where we haven't found it yet just and and, and a lot of times we're putting traps somewhat close to creek necessarily in a creek but um near them because like as Bea said a lot of the you know we might be able to have to find in in those areas so anyway it's um and we haven't had probably as much interaction with the other agencies where they have come over and helped us uh you know but but it's it's working out and we're we're out there um and we're we're doing this trapping right now and we'll be also, at the same time we're trapping, we're, we're looking so Ruben and, and Lance are, are looking for potentially focusing a lot on travel. The other thing I think is, is Julia, the idea of um, going after from Santa Barbara, uh, going into iNaturalist and trying to kind of map out those box elders, I think it's very important. And uh, if there's some way, you know, if you have tree lists or each city or or um, entity can kind of locate those those box elders. I think that's very you know, potentially are going to be they're kind of a, a canary in the coal mine for the as far as the you know trees that are going to go first. So anyway, that's. Thank you, John. Uh, Karen, uh, Lorison, you want to uh, tell us about your program and, and uh, how it is similar or different from what's taking place in Santa Barbara County? 
Um, yeah, so so we in San Luis Obispo County are, uh, I guess we are a proximity county, but we did have one single fine back in 2016 of the Curashio um, Shaho Bar, but we have not found anything since. Um, we have been trapping consistently in where the fine site was and surrounding areas with the funnel traps. So we've been doing that for five years now. Um, the tree was removed by the homeowner, I believe. I think my my inspector, Tamara Kleeman, could give me some details on that or give us the details. But our, our program is uh, the mostly based on detection since we have not find it, found anything since, but we have a $164,000 grant through CAL FIRE and that's mostly high risk trapping. And we've been doing it in campgrounds and places where anybody might be bringing in firewood and some additional tree yards. Um, and then we have a regular detection trapping program that we funded through UC and that's about a $70,000 grant. That does end next March in March, 2022. And that is like general detection. The traps are roughly about one per square mile and are about a mile apart. And we've been focusing that on other parks and that maybe don't have uh, campfire sites and riparian areas. So we kind of place traps along creek edges or little river banks and stuff anywhere that we have uh, sycamore and box elder populations. We, we haven't really mapped our box elders. I think that's a great idea. I really like the idea of getting it into iNaturalist um, so thank you for that tip, Stephanie. And um, we have not had to get full on into this tree removal project, um, but I really appreciate the guidelines that Stephanie's put forth, forth there because it's gonna make things maybe a little bit easier for us. Um, and we just actually have uh, allocated some time and resources to outreach. So we will be starting an outreach program with homeowner groups. And um, I think we should probably be meeting with city managers to let them know what could be coming next. So um, let's see, uh, we're looking forward to um, Hannah as far as giving you our trapping data. We have a lot of negative trapping data, but uh, negative data is just as good as positive data. So uh, if it helps out your research and your data collection, we'll get our trapping information to you. And that's where we are. I'm very happy that we haven't found any, um, but I'm apprehensive for the moment that we do. I do want to add with respect to that outreach comment that we do have a lot of materials available for outreach to residents and to, to various groups and would be happy to work with you, provide you materials as necessary. And that's, that's true for anybody um, who's on this call. And I'll, I'll put my information in the chat in just a moment. But first, I want to turn it back over to Stephanie. I think she wants to carve out a few moments to address uh, some other thoughts. Thanks, Randall. Yeah, I wanted to just before we leave for today is one of the things that, um, you know, I was the person who put other <laughs> in the survey, so I want to out myself. I put that because what I was hoping for was to maybe have follow-up discussions with um, the other cities and the other jurisdictions to talk about how can we kind of communicate better about what the ISHB, how it is spreading in our county. And just a shout out that if you think you have it, you've got trees that are dying, that are particularly sycamores or box elders in our county, you're not sure why, please call us. And we are happy to come out and take a sample. We, if it's a jurisdiction, we are even helping doing chipping. If you remove the pest yourself or the tree, it ends up being positive and you have to remove the tree. We are, for example, helping the city right now with chipping that we've allowed that in our grant. So that really gets it off your plate and helps you take care of the waste and we dispose of it properly. So I was kind of thinking, boy, it sure would be great to have follow-up meeting um, with the other jurisdictions to talk about how we can kind of share where this pest is going and uh, please reach out to us. 
if you, we can also talk about how we can better message with the, um, the public and work with UCIPM on all their materials that they have available to us. So that's what I was hoping to get out. That was my other. Thank you. Very good. I think that concludes all the planned aspects of uh, this meeting. Thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate that. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks for your participation.